The committee will come to order. Uh, today's hearing on the TARP Financial Services and Bailouts uh, Public and Private Programs Subcommittee is entitled The Changing Role of the FDIC. We have before us today the 19th Chairman of the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, uh, Sheila Baer, who has served honorably during uh, some of the, our Nation's toughest times. And, uh, Chairman Baer, we realize this is your last hearing before Congress. Um, and you've had, you've had quite a career in the service to our government and to our people, and I want to thank you for that. Um, and uh, it's through you know, some of the most challenging times in our nation's history, and, uh, and you've also served on Capitol Hill, and, and we appreciate your service there. What's that? Well, we forgive you for that, uh, serving, serving the, on the Senate side, but um, certainly understanding Capitol Hill as you do, we... we uh, we thank you for your time. And um, it, it has been the tradition of this subcommittee to read the Oversight and Government Reform uh, Committee's mission statement. Uh, the Oversight Committee mission statement begins, we exist to secure two fundamental principles. First, Americans have a right to know that the money Washington takes from them is well spent. And second, Americans deserve an efficient, effective government that works for them. Our duty on the Oversight and Government Reform Committee is to protect these rights. Our solemn responsibility is to hold government accountable to taxpayers because taxpayers have a right to know what they get from their government. We will work tirelessly in partnership with citizen watchdogs to deliver the, the facts to the American people and bring genuine reform to the Federal bureaucracy. This is the mission of the Oversight and Government Reform Committee. I now recognize myself for five minutes for an opening statement. As I said, we are pleased to welcome uh, the Chairman of the FDIC, Sheila Baer, uh, for her last testimony before the United States House of Representatives. Uh, we certainly appreciate your uh, role and, and uh, your hard work, and we wish you well in your future endeavors. Um, today's discussion allows members to better understand the role of the FDIC during the financial crisis, the new regulatory authorities issued by Dodd-Frank, and the health of FDI-insured banks. Since 2007, the FDIC has, called upon, has been called upon to resolve 370 failed banks and thrifts. These efforts have cost the FDIC an estimated $83 billion and depleted the balance of the deposit insurance fund, uh, pushing it into the red ink to the tune of a billion dollars. But Chairman Baer has taken steps uh, to replenish the fund, and I think uh, American people uh, should know that this has not cost the taxpayers a dime. Um, that, in fact, this is uh, self-funded by, uh, by the banking industry. Uh, due to the FDIC's role as a safety and soundness regulator for most of the world's largest financial institutions, the Dodd-Frank Act positions the corporation as a key player in preventing a future financial crisis. Dodd-Frank requires or authorizes the FDIC to implement 44 new regulations and grants the regulator various enforcement authorities. Uh, many that stem directly from Dodd-Frank's hope to end too big to fail. Among these regulations are risk retention rules that will dramatically impact the secondary mortgage market and other areas of securitization, as well as increased capital standards set out under Dodd-Frank and being negotiated under Basel III, or as in the South, we call it Basel III. Um, although these measures had some bipartisan support in theory, concerns have been raised during implementation. New risk retention rules could reduce the amount of lending to an already crippled housing market, while extreme capital standards may jeopardize the global competitiveness of U.S. financial institutions. Just yesterday, Acting Comptroller General, I'm sorry, Comptroller of the Currency, uh, John Walsh, stated that additional capital requirements for large firms should be, quote, modest, noting that, quote, capital levels are now extraordinarily high by historical standards, end quote. He specifically cautioned that, quote, higher capital fosters a safer banking system, but if carried too far, the economy suffers when banking activity is not sufficient to support desired levels of real economic activity. I think we all share those concerns, and fi finding that balance is, of course, part of today's hearing is to understand your, your thought process on that. Each member of this subcommittee hears from constituents and businesses that are struggling to access capital. 
Uh, thus, before instituting a regulation, it is imperative that regulators cons consider the flexibility that our small and community banks need to serve our communities. I look forward to Chairman Baer's explanation as to how the FDIC and other regulators will work to avoid one-size-fits-all regulations that would deteriorate job growth in our economy. Additionally, while some insist the FDIC's new regulatory authority under Dodd-Frank will put an end to the bailout culture and too big to fail, it appears the opposite is true. Uh, the Special Inspector General for the Troubled Asset Relief Program has reported to Congress that even after Dodd-Frank, quote, the largest institutions continue to enjoy access to cheaper credit based upon the existence of the implicit government guarantee against failure, end quote. Ironically, Dodd-Frank has actually made big banks even bigger. Five of the largest financial institutions in this country are 20 percent larger than they were before the crisis. Now, this is not uh, directed at the FDIC. Rather, many of these things are design failures in the legislation we passed, and I will have some questions about that and how you see that implementation and perhaps some legislative relief uh, on things that you don't think are quite appropriate going forward. Even Secretary Geithner noted the possibility of future bailouts when months ago he stated that the Federal Government might have to do, quote, exceptional things again, end quote. I know you have been questioned about that before, uh, but the moral hazard of such explicit and implicit guarantees cannot be overstated. These concerns, along with others that Chairman Baer and I both have spoken about, um, are critical uh, are of critical importance to the economic future and well-being of the United States and its citizens. Getting that balance right is a struggle, and you know, in, in terms of capital requirements, uh, we'd like to hear your thoughts on that. Um, and with that, uh, I recognize the ranking member, Mr. Quigley of Illinois, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you for holding this committee meeting, and uh, Ms. Chairman Baer, thank you for attending and for your years of service. Uh, obviously, the FDIC played a central role in navigating the 2008 financial crisis, uh, specifically overseeing two of the largest bank failures in U.S. history, history Washington Mutual and Indy Mac Bank. In addition, in the aftermath of the crisis, <clears throat> Chairman Baer has actively engaged in implementing the necessary reforms to prevent another financial crisis. As the Chairman's tenure can comes to a close, I believe her insight and perspective will be invaluable to the subcommittee's oversight of the events that comprise the financial crisis, as well as the implementation of Dodd-Frank and other reforms aimed at bringing greater transparency and stability to our financial markets. While there were multiple causes of the financial crisis, <clears throat> it is widely acknowledged that regulatory failure through gaps in oversight, insufficient tools, and weakening of bank regulations was a significant factor. Therefore, Dodd-Frank addresses these failures by creating the Financial Stability Oversight Council to ensure coordination among the multiple banking regulators. It also extends the FDIC's resolution authority for failing depository institutions to large non-bank financial firms. And it requires stronger capital standards for the largest financial institutions. These and other provisions have significantly altered the authority and responsibility of the Federal banking regulators, including the FDIC. I was heartened by the Chairman's past statements that through the orderly liquidation authority and capital requirement provisions, the regulators have the tools to end too big to fail. Still, I am concerned by the fact that in 2009, Bank of America, Chase, Citigroup, and Wells Fargo controlled 56 percent of domestic banking assets, up from 35 percent in 2000, while the top 10 U.S. banks controlled 75 percent of domestic deposits, up from 54 percent. I hope here, today's hearing will provide an update on the implementation of these too-big-to-fail provisions. There are also a number of FDIC-related provisions under Dodd-Frank that are critical not only to ensuring financial stability, but also to leveling the playing field between the largest financial institutions, which have only expanded since the crisis, and the community banks and credit unions. These provisions relate to capital standards as well as the manner in which the FDIC is assessed, and I look forward to hearing from Chairman Baer regarding the status and implementation of these reforms. Lastly, Chairman Baer has, praised, has been praised. Lastly, Chairman Baer has been praised as guiding the FDIC to quote 
greater prominence through her fierce advocacy, not just for community banks, but also for consumers. In this regard, I commend you for your tireless efforts to hold accountable our nation's mortgage servicing industry. This is an industry that continues to engage in alleged systemic abuses and misconduct against homeowners across the country. In your own words, the mortgage servicing and documentation problems are yet another example of the implications of lax underwriting standards and misaligned incentives in the mortgage process. Despite numerous investigations and regulatory actions taken by Federal and State regulators and law enforcement officials against the mortgage servicers, more allegations of misconduct have surfaced. Therefore, I look forward to hearing from the Chairman regarding further steps that can be taken by both regulators and policymakers to hold the servicers accountable and protect our constituents and communities from wrongful foreclosures. Again, I thank you. I thank the Chairman for appearing before us today and your service to our country. Thank you. I thank the Ranking Member. And uh, with that, uh, uh, Chairman Baer, it is the uh, tradition of the Oversight and Government Reform Committee and the policy of the committee uh, that all witnesses be sworn in. So if you will please stand and raise your right hand and repeat after me. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Thank you. you. may be seated. I let the record reflect that the witness answered in the affirmative. Um, and again, thank you, Chairman Barrett. You have served under Republican and Democrat presidents. Um, you have had a distinguished career in government service, and we wish you the best going forward. And with that, we recognize you for five minutes for an opening statement. We know you, rec you, you know the drill with the lights, and uh, we look forward to hearing your testimony. Great. Thank you very much, Chairman McHenry, Ranking Member Quigley, and members of the subcommittee. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today on the changing role of the FDIC. My testimony today is focused on two very important lessons learned from the crisis. First, in order to restore discipline in the marketplace, large complex banks and other financial companies must, without exception, be allowed to fail if they become nonviable. The problem of financial companies that are perceived by the market as too big to fail unfortunately has been around for decades, but the bailouts of several, several badly managed, systemically important financial institutions, or SIPIs, during the crisis removed all doubt about their implicit government backing. These bailouts were made necessary by the absence of FDIC-style resolution powers for non-bank financial institutions, as well as for bank holding companies and their non-bank affiliates. The massive disruptions caused by the Lehman failure made clear that the bankruptcy process was ill-suited to the orderly resolution of large financial entities. So forcing bank holding companies into a bankruptcy process was not a risk the government was willing to take. But bailouts have consequences. They undermine market discipline. They inhibit the restructuring of troubled financial companies and the recognition of losses. They keep substandard management in place and preserve a suboptimal allocation of economic resources. In contrast, smaller banks are fully exposed to the discipline of the marketplace. Some 370 FDIC-insured institutions have failed since I became FDIC chairman. This is how capitalism is supposed to work. Failed companies give way to successful companies and the remaining assets and liabilities are restructured and returned to the private sector. Bailouts are inherently unfair. They violate the fundamental principles of limited government on which our free enterprise system is founded. That is why the FDIC was so determined to press for a more robust and more effective SIFI resolution framework as a centerpiece of the financial reform legislation. We were early advocates for a SIFI receivership authority that operates like the one we have applied thousands of times to insured banks in the past. We pushed for liquidation plans by the SIFIs that would prove they could be broken apart and sold in an orderly manner and for greater oversight and higher capital in relation to the risks these companies pose to financial stability. While all of these proposals were ultimately enacted in Dodd-Frank, there does remain skepticism as to whether the SIFIs can actually be made resolvable in a crisis. For the very largest institutions, it will be difficult, but we have many important tools which, if used correctly, can end too big to fail. Under Dodd-Frank, we will have more information about these institutions on an ongoing basis, stronger prudential requirements, living wills prepared in advance, as well as the authority to require, if necessary, organizational changes that rationalize business lines and legal entities to assure that they can be broken up and sold back to the private sector in an orderly way. I hope this is an area where the industry will work collaboratively with the government. The expectation of bailouts creates funding advantages for weak, large banks creating competitive disadvantages not only for smaller institutions, but also for the better-managed larger institutions. 
Most importantly, the reputation of the entire industry is damaged when poorly managed institutions are bailed out by taxpayers and escape responsibility for their own actions. Because of the bailouts, popular resentment and cynicism toward the banking sector remains very high. The second lesson of the crisis involves the dangers of excessive debt and leverage. The single most important element of a strong and stable banking system is its capital base. Capital is what allows an institution to absorb losses while maintaining the confidence of its counterparties and its capacity to lend. After the last banking crisis in the early 1990s, Congress passed a number of important banking reforms that included stronger capital requirements. But capital requirements were watered down over the years through rules that permitted use of capital with debt-like qualities that encouraged banks to move assets off the balance sheet and that set regulatory capital thresholds based on internal risk models. The result was an increase in financial system leverage, particularly at bank holding companies and non-bank financial companies, that weakened the ability of the industry to absorb losses during the crisis and that has led to a dramatic deleveraging of banking assets in its wake. But the problems of excess leverage extend far beyond banking. Our tax system rewards the use of debt financing over equity for businesses and households alike, making them more vulnerable to financial distress. Governments, too, have relied on debt to postpone the cost of paying for services that the constituencies are reluctant to do without. But as the crisis has shown, over-reliance on leverage is a short-term strategy with a big downside over the longer term. That is why the FDIC has been so committed to following through on the capital reforms that are taking place through the Basel III International Capital Accord. That is also why we have been such strong supporters of other measures to enhance capital, including the Collins Amendment to Dodd-Frank, the elimination of trust-preferred securities, and the SIFI capital surcharge. Since 1933, public confidence and financial stability have been the core missions of the FDIC. We understand the economic cost of financial crises. And one of the most important lessons I have drawn from my experience has been the need for regulators to have the political courage to stand firm against weak practices and excessive risk-taking risk in the good times. My main regret is that we did not have better information and better resolution tools in place at the height of the crisis to prevent the bailouts of a number of our nation's largest financial companies. Yes, the bailouts were necessary under the limitations we faced, but they have slowed the recovery, they have undermined support for government in all forms, tainted the reputation of well-run banks, and tilted the competitive balance toward weak megabanks. Our support for a more robust SIFI resolution regime and stronger capital standards in the wake of the crisis speaks to our determination that this experience never be repeated. Thank you, and I would be happy to take your questions. Uh, thank you for your testimony. I now recognize myself for five minutes. Um, as I said in my opening statement, uh, the act, acting comptroller of the currency, um, John Walsh, stated uh, in an interview the other day um, that uh, additional capital requirements for large firms should be, quote, modest, noting that, noting that uh, capital levels are now extraordinarily high by historical standards and higher capital fosters a safer banking system but have carried too far the economy suffers when banking activity is not sufficient to support desired levels of economic activity. So, so Chairman Baer, I, I know we have noted that uh, you and the acting comptroller of the currency have had disagreements on capital levels. Right. Is there a capital level requirement that is too high? Well, I think there, there certainly could be, but I don't think the numbers we are talking about really come uh, anywhere close to that. Um, we are working through the Basel Committee process. I think it is very important to have international agreement on the appropriate standards. And the Basel Committee has done a lot of analytical work on this, uh, looking at uh, the cost of the crisis, uh, the amount of losses on financial institution balance sheets, and how much additional capital would have been needed to absorb those losses to avoid this massive deleveraging uh, that we experienced. Um, it has also tried to weigh those costs against uh, incremental cost increases in lending from higher capital standards. And so the numbers, I think, have very much tried to strike the right balance. Um, the 7 percent Basel III standard, which I don't think uh, Acting Comptroller Walsh uh, has a disagreement with, uh, has been agreed to. Uh, but as part of that agreement, uh, there was a broad-based consensus on the Basel Committee, including uh, with Mr. Walsh, uh, that we would be looking at higher uh, loss absorption capacity for the very largest institutions. And that is the process now. And I have been on record thinking, I think of 300 basis points, a 10 percent uh, standard would be about right. That is actually a moderate when you can look at most of the studies that have been independently done by academics 
or the government. Uh, actually, uh, these studies generally support much higher capital levels based on the type of analytics I described. Uh, the Wall Street Journal, uh, in a recent editorial endorsing much higher capital standards, actually threw out 15 percent. I thought it was interesting. The, the benchmark they were using were what the market demands of a smaller finance company, which clearly has no government support whatsoever, and uh, the market demands a 15 percent um, capital requirement. So I think the 10 percent actually is uh, moderate uh, by all the analytics that we have looked at. I would also add, though, that this is going to go out for comment. Whatever the number the Basel Committee agrees to, this will go out for comment. It will explain the analytics behind the number, and people will have a, a chance to provide public comment before the policy. How are your made. metrics different from the OCC's? Well, I don't know. I, I haven't. Uh, I haven't had a chance. I really haven't seen. Uh, apparently, OCC has done some independent analysis, which I have not seen, and I would welcome uh, looking at it. Uh, I think uh, perhaps he's looking at historical numbers, but historically, I think there's probably a big case that, that this financial system has not had sufficient capital, which is why we continue to have these cycles, a very severe one, uh, recently. Uh, also, uh, if you're looking at risk-weighted assets, unfortunately, there's a lot of subjectivity in uh, capital levels based on uh, how a bank is risk weighting its assets. So I don't know what the, is the, the uh, analytical underpinning is for his, uh, his views, and I would be happy to take a look at them, but I had not seen And that. I don't, I'm not asking about sure. the health of European banks, but sure. in sure. terms of international competitiveness, right. I mean, isn't this important that we are harmonized globally with these capital requirement yeah. levels so we are not, we're not disadvantaged? Well, I, I think it is important that we have international agreement. Uh, I think uh, capital, strong capital is competitive strength and a competitive weakness, and I think European banks are having some trouble now because the way they risk weight their assets uh, is not, does not have the confidence of the market. I think also the problems they are having with the Greek, Greece and other uh, distressed countries uh, with their sovereign debt uh, and the inability to restructure that is related to the high levels of leverage in their banking system, their inability of some of their banks to withstand the write downs on that debt if there was a debt restructuring. So I worry about capital levels in Europe uh, and I worry about the impact that could have coming back to the United States. So I think international agreement is important to get those capital levels up in Europe. Okay. Um, and, and finally, I want to ask you in terms of the, the, the Dodd Frank uh, law as it is proposed by Congress, right. are there items that we should address? as you are walking out the door, right. um, are there items that we should address to fix, to correct, to improve, right. to change, right. Dodd-Frank? And it is intended to be an open-ended question. Sure. <laughs> so I, I think it is it's not a perfect law. Certainly there were things uh, that we would have liked to have seen differently, um, and, uh, and we, can, we can share those, uh, those views with you. I, I think it is a law we can work with. I think on the Title II authority, we feel like we do have the tools uh, that we need. And so uh, I, I do believe that uh, net net it's it's a good law. We're better having it than not having it, and at least for the parts of it where the FDIC has a mandate uh, that that we can work with the authorities that were given to us. So you didn't take the bait. I didn't take the bait. Sorry. <laughs> well, perhaps uh, in another month we can have a conversation. And you can tell me your thoughts. <laughs> okay. uh, with that, I recognize the ranking member, Mr. Quigley, for five minutes. Thank you. Uh, coming from Illinois, small yep. banks, community banks. You touched a little bit on competitive disadvantages there. What else can we do? Well, I, I think the good news is that the, the, you know, the, the, uh, the banking sector is healing. Uh, it is. And it is really all about the economy now and getting the economy on a stronger footing. So borrowers will want to start borrowing more money again. Uh, even smaller banks, we are seeing many instances where they are raising capital. A lot of them that have been on a protected failure list are actually coming off because they have raised uh, capital. So I think there are some very positive improvements uh, in the community banking sector. Um, it's been tough for them, uh, but uh, you know, if you look at the, the the number of community banks that got in trouble as a percentage of assets as well as numbers, it's much much smaller than the kind of distress we saw with the large institutions. So um, most of them actually managed to do this very well. They managed their commercial real estate uh, concentrations pretty well. And we are actually trying to learn in our supervisor process, we are trying to take lessons learned from the successful community banks and, and fine-tuning our own supervisory process. I do think reg burden is an issue. Uh, Chairman McHenry I mentioned this as well. I have endorsed some type of two-tier regulatory approach. I do think that um, regulatory requirements that may be driven by problems we have seen with larger banks. Uh, if you apply them across the board uh, to small banks, even if they really have not much to do with the business model of small banks, 
uh, can make it very uh, expensive uh, for small banks. Uh, they don't have the huge compliance departments that small banks, uh, excuse me, that large banks have. So I think two-tiered regulatory approaches is important. I think uh, simplification of consumer rules and consumer disclosures would help consumers. It would also help community banks. A lot of community banks have gotten out of consumer lending just because the, the rules are just so complex and complicated that they, they don't have the compliance capability to deal with them. Well, I mean, and that is a specific point that we hear quite a bit about the regulatory process. Um, the terms they are using, harsh regulatory examinations, uh, depressing impact these practices have on their ability to lend right. and s support the fragile economic recovery, but some very specific stuff. Uh, the senior regulators in D.C., they keep saying that they are properly instructing their field examiners, but bankers are saying the field examiners aren't following the rules. Right. Then we hear that there's inconsistencies in their decision. The, the, the people uh, higher up are saying that their plans aren't being implemented locally, but we're, they're, the examiners are telling the bankers that their decisions are being um, changed up above, but right. then there's a time lag. That, how these decisions to get back to banks, right. which create inconsistencies and a real problem moving forward. Right. Well, I, I do hear this a lot, and we have. I can, I can tell you the measures we've taken. Uh, I'm kind of beside myself to try to figure out what else what else to do. I, I, we have told our examiners very uh, uh, directly uh, that uh, loans shouldn't be criticized just because collateral has uh, fallen. If you have a credit worthy borrower that can make the loan, doesn't if the collateral's gone down, it, it sh it's, it's still a good loan. Uh, we have not required uh, new appraisals unless new, more credit is being extended. Then obviously you do want to get an appraisal. Um, so we've, I've said this specifically. We've said it in writing. Uh, we've disseminated this information to banks so they know what the rules are. If they feel the examiners are doing it inconsistently, they can tell that to the examiner. Uh, we've told our examiners uh, they need to be independent of the banks. Their job is not to. Uh, they have a job independent of the bank, but they do need to listen to bank management and hear their side of it and discuss with them directly what their concerns are. So uh, we have done all this. We have set up a special hotline numbers for bankers uh, who feel that the policies aren't being applied. We have an ombudsman program that will keep it confidential if they don't want their names to be used. Um, I, I, I Frankly, uh, we have really worked hard on this. I, I think we are not perfect. We have a lot of examiners and more banks than anybody. So perhaps the challenge of getting all this communication out to examiners is more pronounced for us just because of the sheer numbers. On the other hand, when we have received complaints and we've we've drilled down into it, um, you know, sometimes examiners are just being blamed for for bringing the bad news. Bank management is not always realistic about the extent of their troubles. Um, sometimes I find these complaints are actually not coming from the community banks, but some borrowers who were not able uh, to get a loan. And and there are you know, especially in the construction industry, there are just a lot of folks that just aren't credit worthy anymore. Uh, so. Uh, we do try to deal down and get to the truth of the matter, and we have found instances where we have made mistakes and we tried to correct that. But some, in some other cases, it, it just may be a bad situation that the examiners are being blamed when they really have followed the appropriate policies. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, rather than go into a whole new area, I will yield back. Okay. I thank the ranking member. And at, uh, and at this point, I will recognize Mr. Gowdy of South Carolina for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank you for your service to our country, and I would yield back the remainder of my time to Chairman McHenry. I, I, I thank the gentleman. Uh, that is quite kind and gracious. Um, now, we, we mentioned, uh, you mentioned the ombudsman program uh, you have, the, the hotline. Right. Uh, you know, I will be very honest with you. We were going to have a second panel, and we reached out to different associations here in town, right. invited bankers. Right. No one wanted to appear. <laughs> on a second panel yeah. discussing their regulations. How should I take that? <laughs> right? and, How and, should I take that? No, and, and that is really the question. Right. And, um, and I don't, it is not personal, okay, I, no. first of all. Yeah. Um, but there is, it is either that the complaints, they don't want to air publicly. Right. right? right. Um, so why is that? That is one potential. Why is it? Is it are, are they so fearful of their regulator? Right. Or are they fearful of sort of what the public thinks right. of them complaining? Or, you know, is it one of those things that they will grumble, but they really don't want to get into the specifics right. with you? And so, right. so, I mean, it, it's, it, it, and it may just be Washington politics. Who knows? But yeah. I, I thought that was a, a little just odd. Mm. And, I, you know, and so wrestling with that concept, because, you know, I am concerned about regulatory right. overreach, right. as we have discussed privately. But there is a, there is a balance. Mm -hmm. And so 
you know, we look at our banks and our community, and Mr. Uh, Mr. Quigley mentioned this as well, we don't know the health of their balance sheet. We don't know if they have overexposure in raw land, for instance, and mm -hmm. so they're telling their customers, it's the regulator that won't let me do it. Right. When in reality, it's, it's an imbalance in their balance sheet. Right. That's right. Um, uh, or, or they've got a capital problem, a challenge. Right. So, you know, do you have any comments about that? Well, I, I do. I, I've, I've uh, been dealing with this a lot, and uh, I think uh, they shouldn't. Uh, we want. Listen, we want uh, a high quality uh, second to none examination process. Uh, our examiners feel that way. Our leadership feels that way, and so it's important for that process to be one uh, where uh, there is an issue that procedures have not been followed appropriately. That those can be brought to our attention in a way that we. Uh, uh, encourage, uh, don't uh, penalize, uh, so we can look into it. Uh, it has frustrated me, though, because I get a lot of generalized uh, complaints, but when I say, well, tell me tell me what it is so I can fix it, if, if, if you know, let, let's look into it and I'll fix it if it's there, and I don't get any specifics, and so I, I don't know if maybe people just want to grumble <laughs> or, you know, if, if and it may be a, a little bit of both. All I can say is, is that uh, it's my policy. It will be Vice Chairman Grunberg's policy. It is the policy of our leadership in our uh, uh, in our risk management uh, division uh, to encourage and accommodate and look into every single complaint, uh, not the other way around. That doesn't mean we're always going to agree. Uh, we, in particular, when we do look into them, we find that the examiner was doing things appropriately. Now there have been instances where we found something else and we've taken appropriate action. Uh, but I don't know what else I can do. Um, and if people don't want to come forward, there, there's just not much I can I can help with. Okay, thank you for commenting on that uh, because uh, you know it's uh, one of those things that we all deal with, and and you know we want to fix problems where we can fix them. Right. Um, exactly. Now, uh, there's a, another question that kind of goes hand in hand with this. You saw the news uh, last week or the week before with uh, Jamie Dimon's question of of Chairman Bernanke. Right. Um, sort of the cumulative effect of, of these regulations and the impact they will have on the cost and availability of credit. Right. Um, has there been a holistic review uh, by the regulators uh, or at the FSOC level mm -hmm. about the cost of these, uh, of these regulations? Because certainly we agree, and I think it is just economic fact, that they do have an impact. Additional capital does cost, right. but there is a tipping point for safety and soundness by which you have to right. uh, be there. And over the long term, it's a, it could be a net positive. So can you comment on that? Well, we have, uh, no, I don't think there has been at the FSOC level. I think uh, certainly with our regard to capital, there has been a lot of cost benefit analysis. We also, for the rules that we do, uh, and actually we just, our IG just looked at this at the, at the request of Congress, I believe, and we, we follow all the requirements on cost benefit analysis. Our, we have a lot of economists, uh, we encourage that type of economic analysis of our rules. We have also started looking in, in, in particular about community bank impact. And actually, for any rule or guidance we put out, we have a, a separate line that says what the community bank impact will be. So, yeah, I think on an, indivi yes, on an individual agency basis, I think it is occurring. Uh, it, it might be very worthwhile for the SSOC on an interagency uh, basis to, to look at this. I do think there are interrelationships, especially with what we are doing with the uh, derivatives. Uh, new rules and some of the restrictions on proprietary trading, um, what kind of impact that will be and how they interrelate to capital. I think that would be a helpful interagency analysis. But just in terms of raising capital, I, I actually am very confident that, that there has been very good analysis and the numbers we are talking about now are, are more than justified. Thank you. Uh -huh. uh, with that, I recognize Mr. Meehan of Pennsylvania for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And, and thank you. Chairman Baer, for your, your service to our country during what was certainly a very challenging time for our nation. And I am sure you are looking for an opportunity to enjoy the life thereafter. <laughs> but, but again, thank you for your service. You. There are so many aspects of the impact of what we have tried to do in response to the many problems that occurred. But I see it back through the eyes of many of the people in my district who are facing issues locally. Mm -hmm. And I was intrigued by your comment that you know, many of the smaller banks are the ones that are competing now at a disadvantage because of the rules that have been focused on the large banks. And I hear a lot in my community, particularly in the housing sector, home builders, realtors, bankers. And there seems to be a 
a game in which they're all sort of pointing to the other one and saying mm -hmm. they're the ones that are responsible for not allowing us to get going. And everything that I have studied certainly indicates that a robust housing market is a key to getting out of an economic slump. Obviously, with such an amount of underwater mortgages, we're not going to see robust. But I also see small community bankers with responsible institutions who have weathered this area very well, and builders with very good reputations who have proven their capacity to analyze the market. And right now, some are actually looking and saying, now's a great time to take risk mm -hmm. if you understand your market. Mm -hmm. And yet, what I'm understanding from talking and meeting with my home builders is that many of them are up against what they are concerned about as hard caps mm -hmm. for construction lending and development lending. And what I really need to understand is whether or not this 100 percent hard cap mm -hmm. is really that. Is it advisory mm -hmm. or are we creating the kind of hard line standard that locks in right. a, you know, the inability for local bankers and local builders to do what they have been doing for generations, which is to make sound judgments about each other? Right. Well, I think uh, construction and development lending is very high risk lending. And if you look at the failures we've had uh, for the smaller institutions, uh, they've been almost uh, heavily driven by losses in construction and development lending and high concentrations of those. So, yes, the, it's a benchmark, it's not a cap, uh, but uh, the general rule is 100 percent. Those shouldn't go over 100 percent of capital. And if they do go over 100 percent of capital, you need to have special risk management processes uh, in place and board level involvement in managing those risks. Um, so I, there is a lot of scrutiny of C&D lending. It's not a hard cap, but I would say there is a lot of scrutiny of it, and, and, and well justified given the number of banks we have seen that have failed because of heavy concentrations in that area. And again, it depends on the local market, but obviously in some areas they are heavily overbuilt already. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it is probably the last thing you need is to start a new uh, housing track. But, but that, is, that is based on local conditions, and our examiners are asked to look at the local conditions. Well, they are. They, they are taking into factor local, not only local conditions, but the history of both the builder and the institutional. Right. Obviously, the, they don't analyze the builder, but they are living through the, right. the builder is living through the analysis by the, by the bankers. Right. Right. Well, it's a. I'm hoping that that's an issue that can continue to be analyzed on on the local level, and that the regulators will take into consideration uh, that impact. The other issue, which we're getting a lot, of course, from the realtors, and I know you've made comments on the QRM, right. and and some of them have included even you're not quite sure whether we ought not let, if I'm correct, yeah. you know the the the, the yes the incentives right. deal with it rather than this hard and fast rule. Can you give me your instincts on that and where well, we should I, be going I with guess, it? Uh, I, I guess I am a market-oriented person, and so if we can let economic incentives drive lending standards instead of regulators saying, micromanaging it and saying this, this is what your lending standard should be, uh, yeah, I, I prefer that approach. And so I think it is uh, very difficult. Uh, I think uh, the securitization uh, process got completely out of control. It was a huge driver of the crisis. It needs to be reformed. And uh, my sense is, is that meaningful risk retention, skin in the game, will be the best way that we can discipline underwriting standards uh, going forward. I would like to bring the securitization market back. I think it is a healthy part. I would like to have uh, banks have uh, diversification in their funding of their lending activity. But it needs to be brought back in the right way. And um, already we are getting into debates. Uh, I think the staff put together uh, what they felt objectively based on a lot of analytical work were the quote unquote gold standard, uh, which was, was which was the directive of the uh, the legislation. Uh, the QRM was meant to be an exception, not a rule. And uh, but now we've got into arguments about are we setting the standards too high? Is this going to disadvantage people? And uh, yes, my preference would be uh, that just everybody has to keep some skin in the game to discipline it that way, as opposed to again regulators trying to micromanage what those lending standards should be. I think I, I can say that freely because I won't be part of the decision making, as you know. But um, that would be my preference. That plus, and I also agree, I think Chairman McHenry has spoken to this, we need loan level disclosure in these securitizations. For investors buying these mortgage-backed securities need to see the loans inside these securitizations before they make an investment decision. That would also be a very good check on, on underwriting standards. Well, your perspective is very important to us as we look at these policies. And thank you again for your service. Mr. Yeah. Chairman, I yield back. Uh, I thank uh, I thank you, Mr. Meehan. Um, uh, and, uh, 
We, uh, we have votes on the floor now, and uh, so it is my intention. I, I just have two or three more questions okay. to ask, and then we will be able to adjourn. Okay. Um, uh, but um, yesterday, I, you know, I read about a meeting that you had yesterday. It was uh, sort of a, a somehow a, a meeting of all the bank minds. Right. On, uh, on sort of, well, it's an advisory committee. Well, of. yeah, but and you had discussions about this um, uh, orderly liquidation was a, a significant order of uh, right. uh, of the day in terms of question and and so, uh, what I read there was no agreement really on on sort of the proper. Uh, uh, way to approach this. It, it, was there consensus? Can you, can you comment on that? Well, I, I don't think we were looking at consensus. I think it was the first meeting of a, an advisory committee on systemic resolutions. We have a lot of very uh, senior, prominent people involved, uh, representing a lot of different uh, segments of, of the industry as well as academia. And so I think they challenged us. They raised uh, good questions. Um, and uh, I think it, it, it helped uh, clarify our thinking. Uh, and that's frankly what we wanted uh, to get out of it. We didn't want somebody who would just come in and and uh, and, uh, and nod their heads at us. So uh, I thought it was uh, very valuable. I think uh, the message I took away from it is going to be tough, but it is doable. Um, you know, I, I think you know there, there's no on and off switch on this. I can't just turn off too big to fail and say it's gone now after being around for decades. And it's it's going to take a lot of hard work. And uh, on our part, on the bank's part on the Federal Reserve Board's uh, part. Uh, but we do have the tools now to tackle it and end it in a meaningful way. And at least one rating agency has signaled uh, a possible downgrade of some of these large institutions, uh, removing the bump up they have gotten in the past from implied government support. So I view that as a positive sign. And uh, I think we do have the tools to end it. Uh, and over time, we'll end it. Um, in terms of the order of li liquidation authority, uh, some of uh, had uh, some of um, Knocked it, uh, saying that it basically prioritizes sy you know systemic risk over property rights. Right. How do you reconcile that? Yeah, I, I don't understand. Or is that unfounded? That. Well, I think it is. I mean, I think uh, our priority of claims is pretty much what you have in bankruptcy. Um, the things that we can do uh, that you can't do in bankruptcy is we can pre-plan. We can be in these institutions with the Fed on an ongoing basis, collecting information. We can pre-plan uh, with their living will. Uh, so we can work with international regulators and regulators in advance of failure to navigate whatever their requirements might be for facilitating a, an international resolution. And we do have done that with smaller banks a lot already. Um, bankruptcy courts really can't do that. Uh, the other thing that they can't do is they can't um, they can't provide temporary liquidity support, which I think is where some of the uh, quote unquote bailout uh, criticism comes from. But with a financial institution, you really, if you need to preserve the franchise value, uh, you do need to provide some ongoing liquidity support just to keep the place operational as it's broken up and sold off. So those are the things that are different, uh, what we can do better in bankruptcy. And we can require uh, continued performance and derivatives, which is a huge problem uh, during Lehman. And I hope one that the Congress will look at on the bankruptcy process as well. But in terms of how creditors are treated, it's very, very similar to bankruptcy. Uh, actually, I think creditors will come out better in our process because we do have the ability to, to maintain the franchise. It just doesn't fall apart uh, when, uh, when uh, the, the, the filing occurs, as, as you saw with the Lehman uh, process. So um, I think in that sense it will help creditors, but the claims priority is the same. Uh, and uh, we, we follow, uh, we have tried to in implementing uh, OLA to look to the bankruptcy code as much as possible, as we do with bank receiverships, too. And your view is it is going to be a rules-based unwind? It will be rules-based. It will be transparent. Uh, there will be lots of reports to Congress. And uh, yes, and it will be faster, too, uh, and much less laden with attorney's fees and, and other types of administrative expenses. Um, but I, not I think situationally. I mean, it is going to be a rules-based uh, unwind that yes. will be public. You will set yes. the standard. Yes, and it will be competitive. Yes, and it will be competitive too, uh, as we do with banks now. Uh, there is an advanced marketing process. We try to get as many bidders in as possible. And again, that's one of the key parts of the living will uh, process is to make sure that the business lines are aligned with legal entities so that they can be broken up into marketable segments and sold in a very prompt manner. Our process is to get it back into the private sector as quickly as possible. We don't like setting up bridges and running them indefinitely. Um, so that, but that's having that pre-planning is important. And why, with some of them, they may need to do some organizational changes to simplify 
their legal entities with their business lines, so they can be broken up and sold off uh, if they get into trouble. But that is good from a risk management perspective as well. Will you speak to my small business owners? Because sure. they are talking to their banker, uh -huh. and they have had a relationship. They may have good cash flow. They may be profitable. Right. And the banker is saying, the regulator won't let us lend. Right. Right? So, uh, and having met with you, and I, we had this meeting six months ago, and I right. said, you know, respond to this. Right. And, you know, we, right. but, yeah. you know, talk to the small business person who's trying to keep things going. Right. And their bankers tell them it's a regulator. The regulators are saying, well, it's, each bank is different. Right. Um, who, who's speaking, who's speaking you know, the truth here? I, <laughs> We have uh, really uh, strongly encouraged uh, banks to make we also want prudent small business loans. We want them to make small business loans, and especially the small banks have a, a big presence in this area. We want them to make those loans. Um, I think sometimes the regulators are blamed. Uh, maybe the bank is just feeling the small business may be a little too risky, but it is maybe easier for the customer relationship to say the regulator is making them do it as opposed to uh, just saying that they don't think it is a good uh, credit risk. We have set up a hotline for small business, just as we have for consumers. Now we have a hotline for small businesses who they feel they have been unfairly denied credit. They can call us. We will look into it. If it is our bank, we will refer it to another regulator. If it is not our bank. And that has been helpful. Uh, it has been educational for us to see uh, the, the kinds of complaints that are coming in. And I think it has been helpful to the small businesses as well to, um, to understand what our rules say and do not say and what our examination processes allow banks to do and, and, and perhaps discourage them to do. Um, I do think, you know, I think part of the problem here is that, uh, look, the economy is uncertain. Uh, it's making small business borrowers uh, cautious. It's making banks cautious. And so getting the economy on a sounder footing, I think I, I cannot overestimate. Uh, that's really what's going to cure this. Um, and we can keep pushing banks. Uh, and I think, you know, interim government programs to provide uh, support for small business lending are good. But at the end of the day, it's got to be uh, get the economy going again in okay. a more robust way. Okay. So what I'm hearing from you today is you've got uh, some concern about uh, the transparency of derivative transactions and the approach there. Is that? I, I think transparency for derivatives is extremely important. If, if I would put, certainly put that at the top of my list of, of things, uh, I think a lot of transparency could help. Uh, I think a lot of the abuses that occurred in the CDS market would not have occurred if, if regulators and certainly the, the market in general had had a better picture of who was taking what positions and in what, in what size of exposure and what price. So I think that is very important. I think you know derivatives is going to take a while. That market developed. Uh, for a long time without any kind of uh, regulatory overlay. And so I think, as I have said before, doing that in, in some graduated way uh, probably makes sense. I think also, in terms of the problems during the crisis, I think derivatives all gets bunched up together. It was really the credit default swap market that was the big driver during the crisis. And so perhaps particular attention to that segment uh, would, would be a good thing. Okay. okay. And the, the second uh, 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 thing you mentioned, um, is this uh, really a cost-benefit analysis and the cost of the totality of these uh, uh, financial regulations right. and, and rulemaking coming out of Dodd-Frank that right. FSOC could, could uh I think, yes, I think on. looking at the interrelationships of the rules and, and their, and their uh, cumulative impact, I think, I think that is good. I think we, we each have individually been looking at this, but I think uh, that would be a good structure project for the FSOC. Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, and thank you for your testimony. And because we have votes on the House floor, members have departed, and I took the liberty to, to ask a few questions before I depart. But uh, thank you for your service to the American people. Right. You have uh, chaired the FDIC at uh, uh, what would seem like a, a pretty reasonable time when you took, uh, when you took uh, right. your first <laughs> term. That's for sure. Right. Yeah. And, uh, and, and, you know, we, we know that uh, you were very active in, in the financial crisis and trying to make sure that cooler heads prevailed mm -hmm. uh, and to really preserve the insurance fund that you are in charge of. And we, we really appreciate that. And I, I don't think that we will fully understand the, the impact you had or the role you played uh, for for many years, and well, unless you're writing a book, and, which we may know <laughs> may sooner. <laughs> Very good. Well, I hope I hold up. <laughs> so, uh, well, th thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I'm I'm sorry we didn't have more of a chance to work together, but 
uh, I've enjoyed this opportunity and wish you all the best as well. Well, thank you. And thank you for your service. And uh, this meeting, uh, uh, before this meeting is adjourned, members will have seven uh, legislative days to uh, submit questions for the record. Um, and uh, with that, this hearing is now adjourned. Thanks.